All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. I'm Jeff Edwards. I'm an extension specialist for the University of Wyoming, and my co-host today is Jeremiah Vardaman. Good morning, Jeremiah. Morning, everyone. Jeremiah is an extension educator for the University of Wyoming located in the Cody Powell area and uh, always with us, although uh, not able to be seen, is Jenny Thompson. Jenny Thompson is also a specialist with the University of Wyoming and she is the person that keeps us on track and keeps things running smoothly. You may occasionally hear her voice if she has a question for our guest. Our guest today is Derek Skasta. He is the um, Extension Range Specialist for the University of Wyoming with state what, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, statewide responsibilities uh, for livestock health and care. And uh, today we are going to be talking about insect management options in livestock or tactics. Correct, Derek? Is that right? That's right. That's right. Excellent. Well, uh, I think that we might as well. Oh, wait. I forgot you were ah, sorry, Jeremiah. <laughs> for those of you, for those of you who are uh, watching on Zoom, if you're familiar with it and you have a question or something that you would like to share with us, please use the Q and A button at the bottom, or the chat box button, uh, and we will be monitoring those places and try to bring that information forward to Derek. For those of you who are on Facebook Live, please use the comments uh, box. And um, Jenny will pull those uh, questions or comments forward to Derek as well. And uh, we can continue on with our conversation. So with that, Derek, if you would like to introduce yourself a little bit more and what we're going to talk about, it's up to you. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff and Jeremiah. I'm really happy to be with you all uh, today. So uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm the Extension State Range Specialist, and uh, I work on a, a wide variety of topics, one of which is flies on uh, livestock. Um, in my department at the university, we have entomology. We have historically had a livestock entomologist, although it's been a number of years, and uh, I've been working on this topic for a little over 10 years now, and uh, I'm really excited to, to talk about it because it's that time of the year. It's the time of the year to start paying attention and thinking about what your fly management program is going to be for the barn uh, and for the pasture. So we're going to go through some real common fly species that we have in Wyoming and we'll talk about their biology, their effects, and then some strategies to reduce the negative effects they have. And they do have negative effects. <laughs> it's just a nuisance. That's, that's enough for me before the negative effects, really. So, you know, that's right. uh, and, and some of these are, are not a nuisance for people, but some of them are. So uh, yeah. there's implications for animals and humans alike. I, I just enjoy spring. And then when the first flies start showing up, it's like, oh, great. Close the doors, get the screen shut, get everything operational, right? That and then the mosquitoes, right? <laughs> yeah. Patting down the hatches. <laughs> great. Let's go ahead, uh, Derek, if you want to try and share your slides. All right, let me see. So um, yeah, I've got a number of uh, slides I'm gonna go through and uh, you guys feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, we can talk about, yeah, questions that you might have. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about fly management for the barn and the pasture. And one of the things that's really important as we approach this topic is to think about integrated pest management. And um, you've probably heard that acronym IPM. And really that's just combining tactics or strategies uh, in a multifaceted approach. So this is a really cool diagram to me. And I borrowed this from another extension program. And there's the link at the bottom, filth fly control on horse farms. But this shows kind of those general types of tools that we have. And on the left, you can see it goes from prevention, more proactive management to intervention. Um, or more uh, reactive. And at the prevention stage, and what's really important for barns and, and small pastures is sanitation. Because a lot of these fly species, we call them filth flies, because they like kind of filthy conditions with fecal material, urine, or decaying sure. material. Um, you'll note on the right, as we kind of go through these options, we have increased toxicity and environmental risk. So some people may not want to use 
you know, human made chemicals. Um, but as we kind of go to the top of this pyramid, you know, that's when we may want to use some of those tools. And there's a, a right place and a right time um, for those. So speaking of timing, Derek, is right now, are we in the, you know, kind of the bottom tier of this looking at preventative type of activities that we can do in order to maybe lessen our dependence going up the pyramid later on in the season? A absolutely. And so okay. many of these fly species, Jeff, as you know, they are going to increase their reproduction because temperatures are warmer and the days are longer. So right now there may not be as many, but we see that build up in numbers because they're laying eggs and we get new generations. And so these species really build through the summer. So now is the time to start kind of proactive prevention. Um, some of the other options you may deploy now, um, like fed products, because those are systemic and they take a while to get into the system of the animal. Uh, yeah, but so now... So Go ahead. Explain, explain systemic a little bit more yeah. for everybody. Yes, yeah, and I'll talk about that um, towards the end. But that's okay. a product that um, you, you basically feed or sometimes you can inject, and it gets into the animal's bloodstream. And then ultimately, those parasites, which are often blood feeders, as they feed on the animal, they take a blood meal, and then they're affected. So it takes time to get it into the system, systemic, the system of the animal for it to work. Thank you. So one thing that's really important as we think about these flies is to understand their biology. So this is a picture that shows the biological cycle of a really common fly on cattle. Um, it can affect other large animals, um, buffalo, uh, sometimes horses, but this is the horn fly. And uh, these flies stay on the animal for, for most of the day, like 23 hours a day. And they only leave their host, the animal, to lay eggs in, guess what? Manure. Okay? Manure. So when they go and they land on those fly pats, um, they're laying eggs. Those eggs grow in the manure piles and eventually they emerge and then they go find a host. So on this picture, you have these kind of red <laughs> explosions. Um, those are places where we can disrupt this parasite cycle. And we disrupt that with different tools. Sometimes it's on the animal. Sometimes it's selection of the animal. Sometimes it's in the fecal material. So some of the strategies I'm going to talk about, you want to remember, they're going to happen at different um, places in the biological cycle of these parasites. Now, Derek, you just mentioned right before you went into this diagram that, that this fly in particular is found on cattle, but can be found on other hosts such as horses or that. So now, are flies or other insect pests, they're, are they mainly host-specific? Some are more specific than others. So, horn flies are pretty, pretty specific to bovids, so cattle, bison. They could occasionally feed on other um, large uh, mammals. But then you have some other flies, like bot flies, we'll talk about. Those can really be specific to horses and donkeys. So, um, but then you could have things like a horse or a deer fly, and they're more generalist, they're more opportunistic, and mm -hmm. they might feed on uh, you, Jeremiah, they might feed on a horse, and they might feed on uh, a deer later. Oh, so okay. it depends on the species. Horn flies are probably more specific. Um, but then like comparing uh, horn flies to horse flies, horse flies are really free living. They spend most of their time off of the host. And then they get hungry and then they go find a host, take a bite, and then they're off again. So Derek, you mentioned that these flies stay on the host up to 23 hours a day. While they're on the host, they are actively biting, feeding, you know, harassing the animal, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. So, so especially for horn flies, and there's some other flies we'll talk about, stable flies is one, um, but they are taking blood meals and they are biting. And matter of fact, they've taken that proboscis, right? Which is that mouth part. tube, right? The mouth part. They've pierced the skin and they are flowing blood. Horn flies are interesting, Jeff, because they inject an anticoagulant mm -hmm. to keep that blood just funneling through that, that uh, proboscis. So um, absolutely. So there's a couple of ways these animals are less thrifty or less productive. One is they're losing blood. 
but the other thing is they're greatly irritated. And so what do they do when they're irritated? They're stomping their feet, they're swinging their head. They have this paniculous reflex where they just shake their skin. Mm -hmm. All of that results in reduced feeding time. They're grazing less. And uh, so it has a, a negative effect on their um, health. So it, there, there could be weight loss or they're not gaining weight like they should. And, you know, if they're, they're not, if they're not feeding correctly, then they, it may um, allow them to have other complications health-wise, diseases and those types of things that might show up, right? So that's right. So in cattle, specifically with horn flies, if an adult cow is infested, which is pretty common, she's going to be grazing less. She'll produce less milk and her calves that she weans will be lighter. Okay. The same thing would, would also happen for like stalker cattle or yearling cattle. Their weight, their daily weight gain is going to be reduced. So it absolutely affects um, their performance. But in addition, you, you pointed out that there's this transmission of diseases and uh, that certainly occurs. So think, think about it. These, these, flies are biting animals. They're piercing their hide. They're trying to tap into that blood resource. And so there's a number of different diseases that are transmitted. Now, here's an example. We don't have these much in Wyoming. And I'm curious if, they're, if they will um, increase, you know, as our climate changes and is more variable, but that's face flies. Face flies are known to transmit pink eye. So, you might think, well, I only have one problem, but they can um, cause multiple problems. And just like mosquitoes, we know, transmit a number of diseases, um, it's a problem. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, you know, you mentioned on this slide these red uh, points where we can interact and try to uh, interfere with the development of these pests. Do you want to go through those and kind of comment? on each one, what we can do at those stages or those steps? A absolutely. Yep. Okay. So here, when we have flies on the animal, we can use things like a, a topical spray, right? We can just spray those animals down. And that's kind of a direct, you know, we're getting a contact insecticide <laughs> on those animals. Um, I also have something on the host here. So certain hosts are more susceptible or less susceptible to parasitism for a variety of reasons. Um, for example, in a group, of, a group of cattle, bulls generally have more horn flies than cows um, because they have different pheromones, they release more CO2. Um, we've also done some research between black and white hided cattle in Wyoming, and we found that white hided cattle had significantly lower infestation level so we can select hosts and like horses you can have four horses in the pen and you might have one horse that for whatever reason and it might be a blood trait it might be a hair density trait it might be a skin thickness trait it might be a combination of all these things right and that horse might be more susceptible so you might either say i'm going to select horses or cattle that are more resistant or you recognize this one animal needs more attention or more treatment. So the host is an important part of this cycle to pay attention to. So we've talked about this in previous programs. My wife takes me along on walks in the evening because I'm mosquito bait and she's not. So right. it's that same type of thing, right? Yeah, right. You're, you would be considered a coal out of the herd then. Yes. <laughs> I would and, be sold. <laughs> and we're not going to talk about this much today, but lice. Lice are a big problem. And Culling individual animals that are really parasitized, they're really infested, that right there is a strategy because you're removing those reservoirs for those lice that overwinter somewhere, some wrinkle by the tail or something, and then they explode in late winter and early spring. So th this is an, an important concept in this, and it's kind of a non-chemical strategy, right, to think about the animals you have, how resistant are they naturally. This is part of my research program. We're looking at blood parameters um, on cattle to look at their coagulation time and their hide thickness to better understand kind of this individual animal um, aspect. So, so is culling, would that be considered a uh, mechanical or a cultural type of uh, IPM strategy or both? I would call it more cultural, 
yeah, yeah. Or, or animal selection based um, but it kind of fits into that in my opinion and there's some there's some producers that are using these things and these are more kind of large ranch type operations but yeah they, they're not um, they're using it as another culling criteria right okay. so we might cull cows because she didn't get bred she didn't have a calf she has a bad temperament oh by the way she's really infested with xyz so she can crawl through any fence that we have <laughs> right right so it's it's an important part of the thinking process yeah so i um, see your your red points here derek uh, of larval development and emerging larval are we going to use the same control method down on that level that we do up on the host good question jeremiah and we don't so and, and even for those two we might use different strategies so in larvae development there are some products, like I mentioned, the fed through products, those are also called IGRs or insect growth regulators. Um, some of those are actually deposited in the fecal material and that's actually where they affect larvae development. There's also um, other insects, we can fight insects with insects, um, like dung beetles or some parasitic wasps that they will, they will dig into these fecal pies and they will go seeking out these little larvae that are developing. But something else that we can do, which is mechanical, is we can try to break up that fecal material, okay? Um, and that would be like dragging pastures, using a harrow in pastures to bust that up, dry it out, and expose those larvae. And then you have birds and other things that'll feed on those um, as well. You know, another fly we're going to talk about today is called the stable fly. Stable flies, um, they're a filth fly as well. But they're not so much a fecal um, uh, egg lay. They just like nasty stuff, refuse. So that would be fecal material, urine, and decaying this, hay. This fly behind my shoulder is a stable. There you go. <laughs> so, so where we feed round bales are often big reservoirs for stable fly egg lay. So cleaning up those round bale feeding sites or moving those around um, are important strategies for um, – Kind of manipulating that point in the graph okay how about how about like uh bunk feeders or those round bay or not round bale but i'm thinking like when people are doing bale feed and they just place out a large portion of hay and that's fed either over a week period or even a month period that also needs to be addressed yeah yeah that's right that's right uh let me see if i can pull up a slide here since we're talking about it yes one of those types of feeders yeah. So, so these are stable flies and um, you can see here, right, we've got this hay ring, right, to keep cattle from trampling it. So we're trying to reduce wastage when we feed round bales. That's why we roll them out sometimes, things like that. But if you look behind here, right, we've been feeding hay right here. This is a rancher I've been working with for a long time, for a couple months, right? We're kind of uh, into winter here and just look at all the concentration of waste hay with manure and urine on top of it. So there's a couple things we can do. I, I know I've known people that have will burn this stuff. People will rake it, um, other things like that, but this is kind of great habitat for them to lay their eggs. And that's, that's what we want to be managing. Uh, Derek, how did the different flies overwintered? Is it species dependent? So some may overwinter as adults, some may overwinter as uh, eggs or larvae in the fecal matter. It, it just depends, right? So the, the strategy that you can take in the wintertime might be a little bit different than other times of the year. That, that's right. And it does vary by fly species. Okay. So stable flies and horn flies, these filth flies, they're ones that are in fecal material or just kind of decaying hay, uh, things like that. Um, horse and deer flies, they like to lay their eggs along emergent vegetation along bodies of water. Um, black flies, their eggs are in, uh, in bodies of water. So right. high mountain streams. Uh, I'll mention black flies, but if you've been in a, in a black fly uh, uh, emergence period, it's pretty extreme. Uh, it's a good a, time. <laughs> yeah. But then there's things like bot flies and they are completely different. They overwinter inside of the animal. Okay. Okay. So these kind of uh, cultural techniques on, on the land, they're not going to be effective for, for a species like botfly. So one of the important things for IPM is identifying the species that are, are your big problem. And so if you don't know, 
um, working with your extension educators, uh, your University of Wyoming contacts would be really a good starting point. So then you can pinpoint the right strategies to be effective. And when, when you work with us, right, Derek, we, we're not going to know, well, it's a little fly flying around my horse. Well, which one is it? Right. And so what kind of, what kind of information, if I cannot get a physical sample of the fly, what information do, does somebody need to provide us so we can help hopefully identify that correctly? Yeah. So flies are difficult to, to catch, right? So, um, one of the things that you can use is, is traps, especially in barns and stables. So in that case, you, you would have samples, right? So you can send those to our uh, entomology diagnostic lab. We have a colleague, Scott Shell, and he does this as a service to the state. So um, if you have glue traps or uh, jug traps up, you could grab those samples and send them in. The other thing is if you have a, a nice zoom lens on a camera, you can take pictures and sometimes those are suitable, um, especially for some of these larger flies. Uh, one of the things that's, that's interesting about flies as opposed to say ticks uh, in terms of parasite management, right? You, you can't get a picture of a tick on a cow, you know, 10 yards away, but you can on uh, uh, flies. And so as a matter of fact, that's what we use in our research program is a, is a high resolution digital zoom lens. Um, let me show you really quick. There's some other things um, in regards to uh, some of these flies and their position on animals that can be uh, insightful. So horn flies, which are a big problem in cattle, they, they cause a lot of reduction in losses like we've talked about. They have a unique orientation where they always point their head down and they point their wings up. So when you're looking at an animal, let's see if I can get here. Okay, so here's a cow. You can see all these little specks on her side. Those are horn flies. When we zoom in, um, you can see they have the head down, the wings up, and they're slightly smaller than a house fly. So their size would also be an indicator. So we know their orientation, their size, and their host. We can have with some confidence know these are, these are horn flies. Do we also need to know position on the body of the animal where they're kind of uh, gravitating towards or congregating around? Does that, does that play into it at all? In some cases it can. So a fly that I'm kind of keeping my eye out for in Wyoming is the face fly. Uh, it's a problem as we move uh, to the east. So Nebraska it has a lot of face flies, but I've not seen a lot of face flies in Wyoming, but those are congregated as the name implies on the face. So the corners of the eyes, the nose, and they're more of a mucus feeder. Now they're a biting fly too, but they like the secretions of the eyes and the nose. So if you have a lot of flies congregated in the eyes and nose, those very well could be um, face flies. We also have what are called heel flies. And as the name implies, they would be down along the feet. Um, and that can cause some changes in herding and, and bunching behavior in cattle. And those are a problem in parts of Nebraska as well. Horn flies generally will congregate on the body, although sometimes they will congregate along the pole of the head um, near the base of the horns or where horns would be if it wasn't a pole animal. Um, other species, not so much like uh, horse flies um, and deer flies. They're you know, kind of random. They, they'll, <laughs> they just go in. <laughs> yep. But they're much larger than these other fly species I've described. So usually their size, it can be an indicator. Uh, speaking of that, I do want to point out that, you know, I've talked about uh, horn flies. Stable flies have kind of a unique marking, and that's this spotting um, on the body. So if you, if you could collect a species out of a trap, um, that would be an indicator of stable flies. And then let me, yeah, so h horse and deer flies are really quite striking. Um, their eyes, their biting parts um, are quite... Uh, impressive Stri striking physically right you're you're trying to smack them off of you <laughs> that's a really cool picture just uh, so that is what their eyes look like when you yeah. get in that close yeah yeah it's, it's amazing jeremiah's um, been too busy swatting at them to to notice that their flies their it eyes look hurts like that. too much to let them land for too long <laughs> <laughs> um but there's a number of horse and deer fly species um, whereas horn and stable flies, those pretty much are the species that I was talking about. 
So you can see here, um, and they can get quite large. Most of these, with one or two exceptions, are in the, the species to or genus Tabanus, and we call those Tabanids. Um, they're pretty solitary. So where these others are kind of in big groups, you would find these more as individuals. They're very free living. So, uh, but yet they, they could occur anywhere on the body. Um, here's an example talking about the size. Um, so these are horn flies. You can see the head down, wings up, and then here's a really large horse flyer to ban it. So they're, they're quite a bit larger. Yeah, they're uh, three or four times, at, if not more. Than yep. yep. Yeah. yeah. In your previous slide, the, the stigius, the l largest one that you have there, that we have that one. I wouldn't say it's really common, but it shows up quite a bit in Torrington, Goshen County area. And <clears throat> And that's a really good point, Jeff. And let me say this. So, so we really don't have a livestock entomologist in Wyoming. Um, and so that's part of the reason I'm, I'm working on this topic because it is an issue. But out in the Great Plains, some of those universities have really good resources for us. And that'd be the University of Nebraska and then Oklahoma State University. And so this picture here comes from Oklahoma State University. So I rely on them sometimes to, sure. to get the latest recommendations, but some of the species they have and are common may not be quite as common. Um, but if, if let's say we get into a warmer climate, those things, like I think we need to be aware and kind of keep our eyes open. And the Eastern part of Wyoming, there can be a lot of fly pressure, like Torrington, that part of the world. Yeah. Well, and I was just going to ask that, Derek, what is different about Wyoming than those other states? And I'm thinking they're lower in elevation, they're hotter temperatures, probably a higher moisture regime. Uh, is that what's different between us? All of those things. You're exactly right. Um, and elevation plays a big role into that. And of course, elevation influences temperature. So we are generally cooler. You know, that's why the eastern part of Wyoming is maybe has more fly pressure than higher elevations in the west but but even around laramie so about 7200 feet and that's where i've been mostly working on cattle we do exceed economic thresholds on those cattle with horn flies um, some years it may not be every year so integrated pest management in wyoming isn't just treat it is monitor and then determine if it's going to be um, justified to treat but i think that's part of it and we got to know that economic threshold to see if it's worth treating it. Uh, just right. not wasting time, wasting money, wasting chemical right on, on a pest issue that is not detrimental or negative impact to our, to our, uh, our livestock or our livelihood, right? That's right. And, and so an economic threshold sounds fancy, right? It's simple. It's when the cost of the treatment, um, is not is not going to exceed the losses okay the losses you're incurring are greater than that cost of treatment so it pays it pays off you invest a dollar you know it returns two in the prevention of losses so to speak so uh, for horn flies it's 200 flies per cow that's quite a bit it's quite a bit let's look at my, a, my son's really good at counting and and that would be a great exercise for him he's five and just graduated preschool and so that sounds like a perfect task for him it's but, an exercise in patience they, uh, they move a lot too though jeremiah <laughs> it just might add to the excitement and fun yeah so so what we do is with our high resolution images we do all the counting in the lab but y you can visually know right when an infestation is getting up there so um, it, it's quite possible. And, and 100 flies do not cover much, okay? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take a lot to, to reach that threshold. Well, now, and now the thresholds are gonna be different per fly, right? The, the species of fly. And so what about those deer flies that are solitary? Could you have a threshold of zero? Well, <laughs> for some of these species, it's not as clear. And then we have older thresholds that have been around for a while, right? And things like inflation and other things change. So like the 200 horn flies, that's been around for a long time. Uh, face flies, I want to say the threshold is like five flies. Oh, wow. wow. Per animal. So it's very low. Um, 
it, it's 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 hard to d to develop an economic threshold, right? It takes a lot of animals. You have to kind of span that gradient from none to a lot, and, and determine that. But then, if an individual is transmitting a disease, then arguably one is is too many. Yeah. Um, the reality with flies is we're probably not ever going to fully eradicate. And even in some like famous examples, like screw worms, right? Eradication is very difficult. So it's more of a management uh, and recognizing that. But, you know, the irritation that animals um, experience, you know, fr from an animal welfare perspective, especially if it's animals you see a lot like horses, right? If they're super irritated, right? You, you want to go ahead and pay attention to that. And so when I consult with folks, sometimes I'm called out to look at something non livestock related. Uh, a lot of times we will eventually start talking about that too, because it's part of just kind of general land and animal management. Well, and I'd imagine like some animals just lend towards an easier uh, implementation of that management, such as horses. Generally speaking, you can get out in the pasture with them every day. They sometimes are close to the house or you can walk out and catch them with a halter and it's easy to spray them down with a contact fly spray, keep that nuisance off. Whereas cattle may not be that accessible and that easy to go treat and not uh, disrupt their behavior and put stress on them just to put a fly spray on. Well, that's right. You know, there's cattle in Wyoming that don't see people except for a couple times a year, right? So maybe it, spring branding and then maybe it, in the fall at weaning and preg checking. So in those cases, you know, you, you may not see them and you might take them to a high elevation allotment where, you know, you're moving away from some of these areas with a lot of uh, cow pies, fed hay from the winter. So that's, that's a cultural aspect, right? But even then, like you may not have a good handle on it. Whereas, you know, saddle horses, you might see them hopefully, you know, on a regular basis. So absolutely, that, that's part of it. Well, I know hiking in Wyoming, you know, uh, quite often the uh, deer flies and horse flies uh, chase us as we're hiking. So I can't imagine being uh, livestock or wildlife when not being affected by uh, horse, uh, horse and deer flies at higher elevation. So um, it, it's a trade-off, right? It is. And same thing with like black flies when they're swarming like it is so irritating we've just shut down you know field work and gone inside and done something else so the irritation is a big deal and so m maybe we could shift gears and talk a little bit more about treatment options and strategies i have a sure. few things to say about that um so let me pull slides back up here are, are there options as we're getting into this for livestock to self-medicate are there are there delivery tools where they can rub or, or something like that? I thought you meant just go pull up to the pharmacy and just order their own meds. And I was well, like, you, you know, don't give them that much power, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Pharmacies yeah. are far between in the range. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that is something that, that people have talked about as an option, particularly with like back rubbers and things like that. You know, so I'm on the fence about that. And so just kind of as I've, you know, worked with my dad, my grandfather, my father-in-law, you know, he's used some back rubbers and generally the, the cows, I mean, you have to force them through it. So I don't know that there's any scientific evidence that says, you know, if one cow's heavily infested, she's going to go rub on the, the, the rubber more. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah. Just, Some just, folks have claimed that, that that is how it functions, but I'm not, I'm not certain those animals learn that, okay. that response. So I, yeah, I can't, I can't say yay or nay. So what I do want to say is, you know, for the barn and the pasture, thinking about sanitation and trapping is really that preventative first step. So let's say we've identified a problem. Now we want to really make sure we're cleaning up around the farm or the ranch. And this is going to include things like barns, stalls, trailers, which, you know, as we're moving animals around can accumulate a lot of, a lot of mess and then smaller paddocks that might be kind of calving pastures or horse turnout pastures right by the barn. And as we think about sanitation, we want to think about three things, moisture, manure, and bedding. Okay. 
when we start to combine those three things, we create an environment where these filth flies, they want to lay eggs. And then when those eggs emerge, we just get generational buildup. Okay. What we want to do is make sure we're removing fecal material and we're removing rotting hay material, especially with the invention of the round bale. Um, this is a concentration of those things. Okay. The other thing we can use are traps and baiting, especially in structures like barns. And there's a, a, a whole slew of commercial traps and sticky traps and glue traps. I'm not going to put those up there. You know, I'm, I'm sure that um, you can try those, but there are also ways to make your own jug traps with these milk jugs and you can just buy the bait, put it in there. Uh, and that's kind of a cheaper alternative to put a lot of these out. So sanitation and trapping to me is kind of step number one, once we've identified the problem that we have. Well, and as you say that, Derek, it, it makes me think that, especially with our horses, that's, that's a difficult thing to sometimes accomplish because uh, some of us, especially if we don't own a whole lot of acreage and can't turn those horses out, you know, those horses might be stable for a month or multiple months at a time or whatnot. And so, um, and then on top of it, you're, they're urinating in those pens, right? Defecating. We might be able to keep on top of that to some degree, but we're also bringing water in, right? And you're, they're spilling their water tank or we're accidentally missing with the hose or whatever it is for filling wise. So it can be challenging in certain situations to keep that sanitation practice going. And one question I have for you is, as we're bringing that manure out of the barn, we're bringing that bedding, that, that uh, saturated bedding out of the barn and trying to dry those stalls out as much as we can, where do I put that waste? And is there a proximity to that barn that helps alleviate that problem? So I'm not just setting it outside the door and those flies are still there. Kind of. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that, that is something to consider. I mean, the further away, you know, you can get it, the better. Um, you know, if you have the option to put it in like a large dumpster, so let's say you're at like a, a commercial, you know, stalling stable facility, you know, a lot of times you might be, able, they might be hauling it off. So that'd be uh, an option. Um, the further away, the better, you know, is, is going to be the answer. That is a problem because these animals, they migrate, they, they move around. So you might do the very best job possible and you might have a neighbor that doesn't. So, you know, their property is the reservoir and you're just providing these great hosts. And, and as this explosion of these flies happens, you know, and animals are saturated there, they're going to, they're going to move. And so that's something to be aware of. Sometimes you've done all you can do and you're still going to have problems in terms of, in terms of sanitation and trapping. So Don't for my that. personal property, uh, Derek, we have a little, we, we just have horses on the place. And so, um, and they're stalled. And so we have a little manure spreader and, and it's pulled by an ATV. It's a small ground driven manure spreader. And we clean stalls twice a day and that kind of stuff. They are on sand. We don't put a bedding in, but by just spreading that manure, how effective are those manure spreaders at this type of sanitation practice and breaking that pest cycle. Are they comparable to like a, a harrow or a drag in the pasture? It's going to be similar. I mean, cause it's physical, right? So it's also breaking it up by breaking it up and then spreading it out. You um, accelerate the drying process. So, um, you know, I would say it's, it's probably a similar approach with harrowing, you, you may not be as able to evenly distribute it, right, as opposed to a spreader um, where you're slinging it out there. So that, that's a great option, and it just accelerates its distribution and its drying process, which is important. Great. Thank you. So what's the next step? Say we we're doing our due diligence here. That's right. Well, <clears throat> so I'll just go through a couple things um, and share a little bit of data and information. So, so then you can think about resistance, right? How can we capitalize on the natural resistance that animal ha animals have? If you're in the situation, let's say with cattle and you're, you're making culling decisions, you might cull those animals that are more infested than others. This has been um, shown to be effective in lice management for sheep and cattle. I've not found anything on horses. Um, some of this is, is published research. Some of this is just ranchers who over time have said, this is what I've been doing. 
and I think it's working. And some of those ranchers are not too far away. There's a rancher in eastern Colorado that's been uh, showing some of these results. So that's one option. I want to show you really quickly how we have, we know we have some individuals that are more resistant or less. So this is Cal 2303. You can see over these weeks, that little number on top of the cow silhouette is the number of flies she had. And she was always lower than the herd average, okay? In contrast, this cow, as we counted her flies, she was always higher than the herd average. Now we don't know why, you know, blood, hide, those things, but that susceptibility is a big deal. And so as you're managing animals, you might have one horse right in a, in a set of four that is always more infested than others. So what you may want to do is target some of your practices on that horse, right? It might include face masks, coats, uh, boots on the feet if you have flies that are um, on the heels. So, you know, it's not always just you know, getting rid of a, a susceptible animal, right? Because that animal might have other traits that are really important. And this happens in horses a lot, but, but paying more attention to that individual animal and recognizing it has a little sweeter blood or something, making it more susceptible. Well, and I just want to mention there that that's a good method of, of controlling flies on a horse is putting that type of blanket on there. And it's not just necessarily the blanket, but can you talk at all about the coloring or the pattern of that? I can. So <clears throat> I mentioned that we've done research on black and white hided cattle. But when we think about how these flies kind of developed over time to find a host, they have really interesting eyesight, just like those horse flies. Their eyes are really wild to look at. And what we think we know about these flies is when they emerge and they kind of look around looking for a host, they're looking for a large bodied mammal, okay? And they don't really care necessarily what color it is. Once they find it, they may decide if they like its thermal properties and hair density. But allegedly, some mammals have developed these coat characteristics that help confuse flies. And so there's some really famous research on zebras. And so this coat here kind of mimics the coat of a zebra that that striping confuses a fly and they don't recognize it as a large mammal host. So recently some scientists, they painted some black cattle with white stripes like a zebra and they showed that they had less flies on them. So coats that have patterns and stuff confuse that visual cue those hosts are looking for and that Right, it seems silly, right? Do we need cattle that look like zebras? Do we need a crossbreed? You know, your nice quarter horse with a zebra, you know, <laughs> I don't know, but it manipulates how they find a host and see a host. But this might be an alternative, especially like in horses where we have this ability to put a blanket on with right. specific coat patterns. Um, it's a good cultural practice that we can do that will that will confuse them, but it also might reduce how much chemical we need to purchase. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. So now let's say we need to think about chemical control. So we've tried all these other things, right? And we still have some problems. And now we want to use that next tool in the toolbox. This is um, showing the list of tools for cattle that are available. And the point I want to make is there's a lot. Okay. And it's overwhelming. Some of these are really new, but some of them are really old. So down here, I've got this old paper. I think this is from the 50s, and it talks about corral for horn fly control. I think you can still buy corral today, okay? So some products have been around for a long time. What I want to point out, though, is there's really four main ways we deploy these chemicals, okay? The first is kind of this back rubber dust bag deployment. And this would be that, that rubber that's strung up, maybe through a gate that goes to water or something like that. We fill it with the dust. And as those animals go under it, it rubs it on their back. Okay. And my father-in-law has used this quite a bit. Um, what he finds that over time, he has to continually lower that down because those animals, they just kind of scoot under it. But that, that's, a, that's a technology that's been around for a long time. The second is through ear tags. And this is certainly more of a cattle tool. Um, that, that is very useful. 
Um, one thing to recognize, there is some chemical resistance that's developed, especially this class of chemical we call pyrethroids. So if you're going to use fly tags, you want to change the active ingredient um, every year and then have a three-year rotation. So you don't use the same chemical um, more than once in a three-year period. And we so actually have a this, manufacturer of these in Wyoming, correct? Up in the Cody area, in your area, Jeremiah. Yeah, White Hats, yeah. yeah. Um, That's right. And, the, and they're, so, at, they're a leading manufacturer and kind of research and developer of these products. And they're global, yeah. That's right. It's awesome, man. It's a Wyoming company hitting the global yeah. market, right? Now, when you're talking resistance here, you're actually talking resistance of the fly, whereas before you were talking resistance of the host to the fly. So that's I right. just wanted to clarify that a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And like with ear tags, um, this can develop within just a few years. So ear tags, you know, they stay on the animal for the fly season. As they throw their head, they, they rub those um, tags on their shoulders. They rub on one another, and that's how they deploy the product. These tags are just soaked in the, the insecticide. Um, and, and it's been shown that over a couple of years, you can go from 12 weeks to 16 weeks of control to only about a week of control. And what happens is there's a few flies that will survive for whatever reason, and you're selecting for those survivors, okay? So that is a very different resistance concept than the animal resisting. This is the fly resisting the chemical. So now with, with these type of control measures in the ear tags, now is that getting into the fecal matter or is it just systemic throughout the body of the animal? Yeah, it's, it's not so much systemic. It's more of um, that insecticide on the ex, uh, exterior of the animal. So it's a contact then essentially that's being Correct. moved along the body. It doesn't go systemically in the animal. That's right. That's okay. right. Great. So the third way we can put stuff out is just sprays and pour-ons. Um, and that can be as simple as just a cheap spray bottle mixed up and just, you know, spraying animals. And for smaller sets of cattle, that's certainly an option. Um, I've worked with some producers and just anytime they got cows up with a sack of cubes, they would just spray over their backs. And that was their fly program. Um, the one thing you have to remember is this is kind of a shorter term option. You're only going to get a week to three weeks of control. So regular application would be needed through the season. So if you have cattle you don't see all summer, you know, this may not be the option for you. And or also, not right at home, right? You have to go a distance to do this. It, that's it, right. You can keep up with. It's also a good idea if you can rotate products that have different chemical activity with these type of applications since you're applying it so frequently. To also to avoid resistance. That's a great point. Yep. yep. Well, and same, when you guys same, see same concept apply for resistance. And, yep. and it is all of our jobs to try to avoid the development of resistance. Because if, if we get resistance in a population of parasites, we will lose products that are available, right? They just won't be effective. They're, they're not going right. to be useful. Now, when you guys say that, and I change up the chemistry, uh, how do I do that as a as a, cons a customer or as a, a consumer of these products, how do I know that I'm changing up my product? So a lot of companies have now developed rotation schedules and, and what you're changing is what we call the mode of action. Okay. Derek, can you go back to that last slide where you list all the products? Because that highlights the different modes of action of some of those products. That table on the right hand side. Yes. Pretty small that, though. <laughs> that MOA and it talks about different numbers. Those are all different um, modes of action by those different chemistries. So basically, Derek, it's like the base chemical that's the power horse of that product. You need to be shifting that around to different classes of that. Is that yep. correct? Yep, that's well, right. To put, to let put me, it let a different me jump way, out of this one. I'm going to pull up to... another slide here. Okay. Don't want to continue to use a product that has the 1B mode of action all summer long. You want to use something that has a 3 mode of action or a 6. And that information is available on the product label when you go to buy it. So I don't want to go off of the brand name, so to speak. So right. for us, we use Bronco uh, Fly Spray. And so I don't want to go off of that name, which they're marketing and is the brand of the 
that that chemical. So you, so you need to look at the active ingredient, which is listed on the product, and then there should also be a uh, box on the label that talks about um, this is in insecticide category group three or something like that. So right. that information so is available. It, it is. And, and here's an example of an ear tag rotation schedule over a three year period. So we have product names and then we have active ingredients and their modes of action, right? So in year one, we might use a product which is called XP820. And this is a macrocyclic lactone. In year two, we might use products like Corathon or Warrior, which are organophosphates, which are a different mode of action. And then in year three, we might use Python or Sabre, which are synthetic pyrethroids. So you got to distinguish between product names and then active ingredients. Um, another way to think of, of that would be Roundup and glyphosate. Roundup's product name, glyphosate's the active ingredient. So certainly would want to pay attention. And <clears throat> um, oftentimes now, there's, there's advice on these labels for, for these things. So with some guidance, so. Great. So then you had one more option after, or maybe there was two more after the. See if I, see if I jump uh, back the, to the it. The feed through information. That's right. That's we right. have a question related to that once you get. Yeah, there. we have a question and yeah, and I'm sure you're gonna cover it. Uh, so Jody asked, how about mineral and lick dubs that have fly inhibitor that passes into the manure? And I think we're just about to get there, Jody. Yep, yep. So these are these oral products. Um, am I sharing my screen there? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, sorry about that. Here we go. Yeah, so these fed through products are kind of that, that next option. And <clears throat> these are often in some kind of, uh, and it can be a dry mineral, it can be a, a, a syrup, molasses type tub they come in different mixes you can even buy the product and choose how you want to mix it so, so that is an option as well um, and we call these as i said before fed through igrs or insect growth regulators what these do is kill the larvae and the manure here's the critical thing you have to have steady intake over some period of time before there's going to be efficacy and what, this is what I see happen. People get into pretty bad fly infestation. They've tried some things, they're not happy. They say, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go do the fed through product. So they go buy one sack or one tub, they feed it, they don't realize the control and, yeah. and then they, they give up, they're frustrated. Because these cost money, right? These aren't necessarily cheap products. So if you're gonna go this route, you've gotta commit to it. Um, I work with a ranch um, between Laramie and Cheyenne for years they were trying a bunch of different things and they've really committed to this option and they're really happy with it um and it's it's a it's an award-winning ranch i mean it's a, a operating at a high level so um i do want to point out that as you think about the costs of these things right the upfront cost and then the repeated treatments can affect the cost through the season okay so when you compare things like ear tags versus sprays it might seem cheaper to do the pour on or the spray until you start to add up the subsequent retreatments and that can add up over time. Okay. So as people kind of weigh the, the cost of it, you got to think, is this a one-time deal or do I have to redeploy this at uh, intervals through the season? Well, again, back to your, your comments on the oral or the fed through products. Um, so how long do I in a probably depends on the product, but how long do I need to feed that product for? You said there needs to be a steady consumption before you see that control effect. It, is, it, is it an amount, a quantity that that animal needs to take in in a certain period of time, or is it a certain length of time they have to be exposed to that? So it, it's a little bit of both, and different products are going to have different amounts and different lengths of time. Um, so I'd be lying to you if I tried to give you a number right right now, Jeremiah. Um, well, and you're trying to build up the uh, product in the fecal matter. You're not trying to build the product up in the animal. So these products aren't systemic. You feed through, it passes through, and then it, it leaves that treated pet out around. And you're trying to provide enough of those pets so that it affects the flies. Gotcha. 
we have a, a comment slash question. Um, so that need to feed for longer periods has to do with the timing of the life cycle of pests, correct? It has to do with the, the timing of the life cycle, but it has to do with the buildup in the animal. Okay, so if you're anticipating, you know, fly problems are gonna start to escalate on a certain date, you need to back up and probably plan for, I would say probably four to eight weeks of feeding leading up to that. So if you wanna go this route, you wanna get them onto the product before the problem starts to escalate it is essentially my, my personal position on it. So right now we're just starting to see flies emerge. We're just starting to see flies out and about. We're not seeing really maybe big concentrations of them yet, but this is the time to be feeding it or possibly even sooner than now in anticipation of that fly load coming on. That's right, that's right. So I think for fed through products, now is the time to get them on. Um, and let me say this about timing of deployment. That This is a good point. Um, when we, start to consider different products. Let's say we're gonna use ear tags. Well, timing is really important there as well because as those products are in the environment, that insecticide starts to decay and wear out. And so the efficacy over the season can decline. Sometimes it is not easy to get those out at the, at the right time. So you might say, well, okay, we're branding on Saturday, you know, May 1, let's go ahead and put these ear tags in but maybe your fly problems really don't ramp up until June 15 in your country. Well, that's six weeks of environmental exposure and decay on those ear tags. And by the time those flies really emerge and build, those products are not as effective anymore. So sometimes IGR is a little earlier, ear tags, you might wait and try to be more spot on with those um, kind of more episodic infestations. But then again, that, that thinking through that in the fall I, I, is where I'm going with this, I guess, is I don't want to put an ear tag on in, in October, November when that fly load's coming on. Yep, that's right. And for fly tags, one other thing, you want to make sure and pull those out in the fall because leaving those in can help uh, facilitate the development of resistance as well because it's just trace amounts that are left. So the, the ear tag, Thing, like it's a it's a spring and a fall or a early summer and a fall activity to put them in and pull them out yeah. so oh, that's, full effects. that's right that's right so i noticed on there on one of your one of your slides there derek that you had the vet gun we need to talk about that <laughs> let's do let's do you know what you even have one i got one right here <laughs> yeah yeah I'm not going to say who paid money for it, but it has been in use. <laughs> so it's important to know what products are available. And, and this is one of those products. Um, in essence, it's a, a paintball type gun that deploys product on animals. Um, of course, there's a lot of concerns. And, and what I've heard about the actual use of this one is those cows did not like being shot. Um, so, so certainly there's, you know, if you're going to use any of these kind of where you have to work those animals or be near them, you've got to think about, are they going to be uh, as accepting? The same thing happens with just a spray gun, uh, a sprayer. Some of those animals will not be bothered. There will be individual animals that do not want to be sprayed. So it's a similar problem. Um, that's about all I can say is it's a product that is out there. It's been out there for about uh, it's been a good number of years now, eight or 10 years, I'm going to guess, the vet gun. So, um, And it's maybe more fitting for an environment where you can't get your hands on the animals. They're out on a big country, something like that, uh, is my speculation. It's probably not going to work real good for me that I have two acres in the backyard. I probably don't want to go around harassing my cows and shooting them up with a vet gun, even though that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> I think if, if you had like a bull pasture and you had some bulls that were hard to handle and sometimes bulls can get really infested, you know, it, it, that, that might be an application where it's, it's worthwhile. So everything has its kind of niche application, the right place and time to use it. You know, this is just another option that's out there on the table. So I don't, I don't discount it, but it, it's unique and there's probably some drawbacks to it as well. So, but it is available. Sure. Excellent. 
what else, Derek? Any any other thoughts that we haven't got to in this show? I, I, I really have enjoyed the show. I think we were very thorough and, and covered all the bases around. But any other thoughts that you have that we didn't get to that you'd like to, to mention? Well, th- this is one of those persistent challenges every year. Um, there's other species like bot flies we didn't talk as much about, but those are a big problem in horses. It doesn't take many to be a problem. Their life cycle is totally different. They live inside of the animal most of the, the year. Um, bot flies multiple... are just disgusting. We didn't want to talk about them, Derek. <laughs> yeah, but, but for horse owners, you've got to be aware of them. So yeah. um, Extension has a nice bot fly article. Let me, let me share my screen one more time. And I'll just point out a few other resources that folks can, uh, can consider here. Great. And we can get those resources from you later after the show and post those up on the website uh, at the Barnyards and Backyards website so people have access to those. So Dr. Lloyd had this document out. I still refer to this. This is Insect and Related Pests of Livestock in Wyoming. Um, you can find that online as MP23. And you could email any of us and we'd be happy to help you get to that. And then um, there's two other extension documents that are out there. Um, on the top left, what's eating your horse? Understanding the bot fly. This is put together by Scott Shell. Really insightful. Different management is needed if, if you think your horses have picked up some bot flies. Um, and and it's, a, it's a totally different problem. And then black flies, of course, can be a problem when they're swarming. If you have running water, um, smaller mountain streams is places where they'll have larvae. Um, so you could have problems we're not talking about today, but uh, University of Wyoming Extension wants to help with these issues. We realize they just pop up when you, when you start to recognize them. So if we can help, yeah, please contact me uh, or anybody, and we'll sure put you in touch with the resources we have. Fantastic. We have one more question before we wrap her up, Derek. Any thoughts on fly predators? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, this is not an area I've worked on as much, so I don't know as much about it, but certainly there's kind of these parasitic wasps um, that will get into fecal material. Dung beetles do the same thing. Um, so that isn't an, an option. That's what we would call biological control. Um, I don't know how readily used it is in Wyoming. One of the things is how do these other insects survive in the environment? And so you know, I think some of those have been used in warmer climates, but certainly, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interest in that. And I think we'll see more developments over, over the coming years. Well, and I've heard a little bit about uh, uh, what you mentioned before of, of dung beetles, essentially. And they're not necessarily feeding on the, the flies themselves or the larvae, but they're, they're removing habitat, right? The dung, they're rolling the dung away or feeding off of it and removing the dung from pastures. And That's right. So there's a, lot, a little bit of interest out there in terms of not using those fed through products because I've heard that they can impact the dung beetle um, because they're also feeding on that and that has that insecticide in there. And, and there's some, I think, evidence that other products like ivermectin um, might also, and it doesn't necessarily affect the, the the beetles but it changes the consistency of the dung pat which changes how the beetles may um, be able to affect it so that is an area that needs a lot of research i don't think it's as readily understood how the products we use affect either the the dung beetles or other types of insects and then the fecal material but yeah they break it up and they just expose and yeah they do what the harrow does basically great well, with that, Derek, we're going to end the show now and, and really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on and taking time out of your day to, to share your knowledge on this topic. I think it's a relevant topic that, that all of us are dealing with on a, on a yearly basis, if not sooner. Um, so, But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank we want to end the show now and, and just let you guys know, we mentioned it briefly but we have a website, if you're not familiar with it, get on there. It has a lot of great resources, known as barnyardsandbackyards.com. Uh, get on that URL, look at that website. We have on that website a page dedicated to this Barnyards and Backyards Live. It has the schedule on there. So if you want to see what's coming up in the shows, uh, look on there. And it also has the link, so you can join us via Zoom. 
Uh, if you are interested in past shows or shows like this one, we're recording them. We are posting them back up on that website. So please look at, you can view this show again. You can share it out. Um, you can look at past shows. So uh, we have that. Also as well, Derek shared some great resources with us. We try and link those resources that we talked about in those shows on that website as well. So you can access those but, uh, resources, whatever they were, articles, videos, so you don't have to go around and hunt them. The other thing Derek really highlighted and we always appreciate uh, but we want to offer an extend to you that reach out to your extension educators. So we have an extension office in every county in Wyoming and on the Wind River Indian Reservation, and we're here to help you. So reach out to them. Those specific offices may not have the specific knowledge on flies in particular, but they can and will connect you down to resources such as Derek Scasta down on campus or any other faculty members or spe uh, specialists down at the Laramie campus. That's the benefit of Extension. We're a network for you and we try and do our best to get you to the resources you need. The last thing, we really appreciate you guys joining us as always. Uh, we need to hear from you. We need your feedback. So we have put an evaluation in the comments for the Facebook Live folks. I think uh, Jenny put it also here on the Zoom chat. But once you close out of this Zoom link, if you're joining us via Zoom, you will have an internet browser pop up with an evaluation. If you can just give us a little bit of your time to give us some feedback of how well we did, it really guides and shapes how we're doing, how well we're addressing uh, specific interests. And with that, have a happy Memorial Day weekend. Have a great long time. Thank you for joining us on this Friday morning. Thank you again, Derek. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Derek.